Hello, and welcome to Differential Equations. This is Lecture 30, Fourier Sign Series. Last time, we talked about eigenvalues and boundary value problems. This time, we're going to talk about writing any function as a sum of eigenfunctions. Okay, so let's start. by discussing orthogonal bases made up of eigenvectors of some matrix. OK, so in a moment, we're going to be discussing this for differential operators. But let's start by discussing the case of matrices, just because it's simpler. So we know that not every matrix has a complete set of eigenvectors. Right. For example, the matrix, uh, say, 2, 1, 0, 2, does not. Right. It's a deficient matrix. It turns out that if A is symmetric, then it does have a complete set of eigenvectors. So here, symmetric means that the ith row of A is the same as the ith column of A for every i. So for example, an, a two by two matrix is symmetric if it has this form. If I have a matrix, say one, one, zero, one, two, three, zero, three, five, this is. But if I have the same matrix, and say I make that a minus one, then this is not. OK, so here's a theorem. Every real symmetric matrix of size n by n has a complete set of eigenvectors. A V1 through Vn, 
these vectors are linearly independent, right? That's part of what we mean by a complete set of eigenvectors. They form a basis of Rn and can be chosen to be orthogonal. Meaning that when you take the dot product between vi and vj, you get zero whenever i is different from j. Okay, so what do we mean by basis? Saying that v1 through vn is a basis is the same as saying that every vector W in Rn can be written as a linear combination of these vectors and in only one way. So if we're given a vector w, then we know that there are scalars alpha 1 through alpha n, such that w is equal to alpha 1 v1 plus alpha 2 v2, and so on. That's what it means to be a basis. Now, because these vectors are orthogonal, these scalars are easy to find. For example, if we take the dot product of W with, say, V2, we get V2 dot W is same as V2 dot alpha 1 v1 plus alpha 2 v2 plus dot 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 alpha n v n, right? So then you can put the dot product into the sum. So you get alpha 1 times the dot product of v2 with v1 plus alpha 2 times the dot product of v2 with v2 plus alpha 3 times the dot product of v2 with v3 and so on. Right, But this condition saying that the dot product of v, i, and v, j is zero if i is different from j means that these are going to be zero unless we're looking at the second one. So dot product of v2 with v1 is zero. Dot product of v2 with v3 is zero. Dot product of v2 with vn is zero. So the only term that survives in the sum is alpha 2 times the dot product of v2 with v2. And so we have alpha 2 is the dot product of v2 with w divided by the dot product of v2 with v2. And of course, there was nothing special about 2. Alpha j is equal to the dot product of vj with w 
divided by the dot product of vj with vj for all j. Okay, so something similar. is true for some differential operators. Such as L would take minus taking two derivatives with some important differences. For example, instead of eigenvectors, we'll have eigenfunctions. And we won't have finitely many, but infinitely many. Also, the dot product will be replaced uh, by an integral. OK, so let's go ahead and state the main result here, which is known as the Sturm-Louisville theorem. It's, it's named after Charles Sturm, who lived from 1803 to 1855, and Joseph Louisville, who lived from 1809 to 1882. Louisville is the, the most famous, uh, more famous mathematician among these two. Louisville was a very wide-ranging mathematician. He worked on a bunch of stuff. He's most remembered for showing the existence of transcendental numbers. So uh, a number is transcendental if it's not the solution of a, um, if it's not the root of a polynomial with integer coefficients. Uh, so he, he was trying to prove that E and pi were transcendental. This was done later. Uh, but he was able to show that um, the number you get by putting uh, a, um, by taking decimal expansion and putting a one at uh, n factorial for arbitrary n and otherwise putting a zero, that number is transcendental. And that was the first number that was shown to be transcendental. He also uh, championed Galois theory. So after Galois died as a young man, his work was in, in danger of being forgotten. Louisville uh, championed it and, and um, you know, wrote expository works explaining it, and and it was thanks to him that it became prominent. <laughs> also, interestingly, he was involved in the 1848 revolution in France. Right, this is the revolution that um, brought down the House of Orléans. Uh, he he actually uh, was um, part of that. Okay, but here's what the theorem says. Suppose that uh, we have some functions and we want P and its first derivative, also Q and W to be continuous functions on the interval AB. And I want P to be a positive function, W to be a positive function. Then we want to consider the weighted eigenvalue problem. L of Y is equal to lambda W of X times Y, right? So this W is like a weight function, and so it's gives us a weighted eigenvalue problem. 
or the operator L of Y equals minus the derivative of P of X times the derivative of Y plus Q of X, Y. on the interval a, b, subject to the boundary conditions. Alpha one, y of a, plus alpha two, y prime of a, equal to zero. Beta one, y of b, plus beta two, y prime of b, equal to zero, All right? Here, alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, beta 2 are constants, and I need at least one of the constants on the left endpoint, one of the constants for the boundary condition at the right endpoint to not be 0. Then here's what we can say. First, there are infinitely many eigenvalues. Call them lambda one, lambda two, and so on. All of which are real numbers. And the limit as n goes to infinity of lambda sub n is plus infinity, right? So you have infinitely many eigenvalues and they don't accumulate at any finite number, but instead they go off to infinity. Right? Two, the eigenspace of each lambda k consists of multiples of a single function. Let's call it y sub k, right? So multiples of it. So this function is not um, canonically defined. There's a lot of choice. If, if you have one such function, you could always take three times that function or seven times that function or whatever you like. Eigenfunctions corresponding to distinct eigenvalues are orthogonal, but with the dot product. replaced with an integral, right? So namely, what we know is that the integral from A to B of Y sub I of X times Y sub J of X times the weight function is equal to zero if I is different from J. And then the fourth conclusion is that the eigenfunctions form a basis for functions in that every sufficiently nice function f can be written as an infinite linear combination f is equal to the sum j goes from 1 to infinity alpha j y sub j.
right? With these alpha j's just constants. All right, so here I put sufficiently nice in quotes. Um, there are different meanings you can give to this infinite sum. And depending on what meaning you give to it, what conditions you need to put on F for this sum to, to work. Um, if F is, say, uh, continuous and its first derivative is continuous, then this sum converges in the usual sense in at every point in the interior of the interval AB. So you can just think of this as meaning that. Right. Now, as a remark, if f of x is equal to this sum, then we can find the individual alpha j easily, right? Just like we did uh, in the finite dimensional case, right, for matrices. So I consider for any fixed K, the integral from A to B of Y sub K of X times F of X, W of X, DX, right? This is the integral from A to B of y k of x times this sum, j goes from one to infinity of alpha j, y j of x, w of x, dx, right? And assuming the sum behaves well enough, and it does, so that I can pull it out of the integral, then we have the sum, j goes from one to infinity of alpha j times the integral from a to b, of y, k of x, y, j of x, w of x, dx, right? And we know that this is zero, right? This integral is zero if i is different from j. So if k is different from j in this case. So that means the only term that survives in this sum is the term where the j that you're summing over is equal to k. So we end up with alpha k times the integral from a to b of y k of x squared times w of x dx. So then we can solve. Alpha k is equal to the integral from a to b of y k of x, f of x, w of x dx divided by the integral from a to b of y k of x squared w of x dx. Okay, so this is an amazing theorem, right? You're taking essentially any function, any sufficiently nice function, and you're writing it as a linear combination of these eigenfunctions. So let's work out an example. Last time we found that the eigenproblem minus y double prime equals lambda y with y of zero equal to zero, y of l equal to zero. has eigenvalues n pi over l squared with n equal to one, two, three, and so on. And the corresponding eigenspaces are just multiples of sine of n pi over l x with a arbitrary. So notice that the Sturm-Liouville theorem 
applies with p the function p equal to one, the function q equal to zero, the function w equal to one, right? Because we ended up here with minus y double prime, right? So the uh, the Stern Mobile operator would generally be minus uh, p of x times y prime prime plus q q of x y prime right equal to lambda y so equal to lambda times wy so if you compare this with the equation we have you see that if you just need to put p equal to one and q equal to zero and w equal to one okay so great so then the theorem applies and we have all of these conclusions Right. So the first conclusion is that you have infinitely many eigenvalues, right? That they are real numbers and that they go off to infinity. The second conclusion is that the all of the eigenfunctions are multiples of a single function, right? And indeed, here's the eigenspace and it's just multiples of a single function. Okay, we can take y sub k of x, well, let's, let's call it y sub n since that's what we're using for these eigenvalues. y sub n of x to be sine of n times pi over L x. And then part three of the theorem guarantees that if you take the integral from zero to L of um, one of these functions, so say sine of n pi over L x, and multiply it by another one of these functions, say sine of m times pi over L x, then I would put the weight function, but the weight function is just one, the x, that this is equal to zero if n is different from m. Okay, this is also easy to check directly. By using the trigonometric identity. sine of an angle times sine of another angle is equal to one half cosine of the difference between those two angles minus cosine of the sum of two angles. Also using this identity, we can compute that the integral from zero to L of sine of n pi over L x, all of that squared, is equal to the integral from zero to L of one half of one minus cosine of two n pi over L x dx, right? So it's easy to see the first term, there's one half, it's going to integrate to L over two, while this second term, minus one half of cosine two n pi over L x, is going to integrate to zero no matter what n is, because you're integrating a full period of this uh, periodic function, and the integral of sine or cosine over a full period is zero. So this is just L over two. And this is useful to compute. <clears throat> 
when it comes to part four of the theorem. Part four of the theorem tells us that every sufficiently nice function f defined on the interval zero L can be written as an infinite sine series, right? So f of x equals sum n goes from one to infinity of alpha n times the sine of n pi over l x. This is known as the Fourier sine series of f on the interval zero L. The coefficients of the Fourier sine series are given by, well, alpha n would be the integral from zero to L of f of x times sine of n pi over L x dx divided by the integral from zero to L of sine of n pi over L x squared dx, but we just computed that. So we can write this as two over L times the integral from zero to L of f of x sine of n pi over L x dx. Okay, so it's worth asking in what sense Does the Fourier sine series represent f? Well, for example, if f um, is C1 on the interval, right, meaning that f and f prime are continuous on this interval, then the Fourier sine series converges to f of x whenever x is in the open interval, so strictly between zero and L. Notice that regardless of of F, the sine series is equal to zero at x equal to zero and x equal to L, right? So if you just plug in x equal to zero, the sum, then all of these terms are zero. So this sum just adds up to zero and doesn't care what F you were looking at, right? Same thing, if you plug in x equal to L, then this is sine of n times pi and n time, sine of n times pi is equal to zero. So again, the sum is just zero at x equal to L, regardless of 
what f is. So if f doesn't vanish at x equal to zero and x equal to pi, then there's no way it's gonna match this sum. However, it turns out that if f is c1, then that's the only place where the sum doesn't match. Uh, the, the series converges on the open interval and it converges to f of x. Okay, let's find the sine series for a few functions. So let's find the Fourier sine series of the function fx equals x on the interval zero L. Okay, so to find the Fourier sine series, we just need to find these coefficients, these alpha sub n. So let's compute that. So here, alpha sub n would be two over L times the integral from zero to L of x times sine of n pi over L x dx. Okay, so of course we want to integrate this by parts. If I differentiate x, the integral will get simpler. And if I integrate sine, it's not going to make it any worse. So we'll integrate by parts. We're going to choose u is equal to x and dv is equal to sine of n pi over l x dx. So that means that du is going to be the same as dx. And that means that v is going to be the integral of this, so minus L divided by N times pi cosine of N pi over L x. Right. So if we do that, we have this factor of two over L, and then I'm going to get U times V, so that would be minus L times x divided by N pi times cosine of N pi over L x, all of that evaluated at 0 and l, and then minus the integral from 0 to l of v du. So that would be minus l over n pi cosine of n pi over l x dx. OK, so what do we get? That's 2 over l, and then um, okay, so I need to evaluate this at L and then I need to evaluate it at zero. I have a factor of X here. So when I evaluate it at zero, I just get zero. So I can ignore that one. I just need to evaluate it at L. So I'd end up with minus L squared over N pi times cosine of N pi. And then plus this integral the integral uh, from zero to L. Well, let's just go ahead and integrate that. So that would be L over N pi squared times sine of N pi over L X. And I need to evaluate that between zero and L. Okay, so when I put uh, X equal to L, I end up with sine of n pi. Sine of n pi is zero. And when I evaluate at zero, I get sine of zero, and that's zero. So this term is just always zero. So I end up with only this first term survives. So I end up with minus 2L over n pi times cosine of n pi. Now, cosine of zero is one, cosine of pi is minus one, cosine of three pi is one, cosine of four pi is minus one, and so on. So that's minus one to the n. So altogether, I could write this as two L over n pi times minus one to the n plus one. Thus, we found that X is equal to the sum n goes from one to infinity of minus one to the n plus one times two L over n pi times sine 
of n pi over l x. Okay, uh, you could, it's fine just as it is, but you could pull out the factors that don't depend on n and then just keep the sum minus one to the n plus one divided by n sine of n pi over l x. Okay, that's the Fourier sine series for the function x. And as we talked about a moment ago, this is guaranteed to converge and this converges to this value as long as you're in the interior of this interval. Okay, let's, let's work out another one. Suppose we want to find the Fourier sine series. Let's do a simpler one of the function f of x equals 1 on 0L, so just a constant function. So again, we just need to compute the coefficients. So we compute alpha n would be 2 over L times the integral from 0 to L of 1 times the sine of n pi over Lx dx. Right? So this is simple enough to integrate directly. So that's just 2 over L times um, L over n pi minus cosine of n pi over L x, right? Evaluated between zero and L, right? So it would be minus two over n pi times cosine of n pi minus cosine of zero, which is one, right? So it's minus two over n pi times cosine of n pi is minus one to the n and then minus one. Right, so notice that if n is zero or even, this is equal to one, and then one minus one is zero. But if n is odd, say one, then this would be minus one minus one is minus two. So then multiply with this minus two, I'd end up with four over n pi. So we're gonna get zero if n is even and four over n pi if n is odd. Okay, so let's write the positive odd numbers as 2k plus 1 with k starting at 0 and then 1 and so on. Then we have one is equal to the sum k goes from zero to infinity of four. And instead of n, I'm going to put two k plus one times pi. Time sine of two k plus one times pi over L times x. Okay, this is the Fourier sine series for the function one, right? And so clearly this left-hand side does not match the right-hand side at the endpoints, right? Because like we talked about a moment ago, this sum, every term vanishes when x is equal to zero and when x is equal to L. However, at every point in the interior of this interval, this sum converges to the function one. Okay, let's do another example. Suppose we want to find the Fourier sine series. Of the function f of x is equal to L over two if uh, zero is less than or equal to x less than or equal to L over two. And x minus L over two 
if L over two is less than or equal to X, less than or equal to L. And I want the Fourier sine series on the interval zero L. Okay, so again, we just need to compute the coefficients. So alpha n is two over L times the integral from zero to L of f of x sine of n pi over Lx dx. So that would be, what we'll do is we'll break up this integral as a part from zero to L over two, right? Where f is L over two. plus a part where we're integrating between L over two and L, where the function is X minus L over two. So this first integral, the two over L and the L over two cancel and we end up with just what we get from this integral, minus L over N pi times cosine of N pi over L X evaluated between zero and L over two. And then here we have, uh, we of course integrate this by parts. So we're gonna have this two over L and then the first term is going to be minus x minus L over two times uh, L over N pi cosine of N pi over L x right, evaluated between L over two and L. And then we're gonna have minus the integral of minus L over N pi times cosine of N pi over L x between L over two and L dx. Right, so this first term gives us minus L over N pi times cosine of, uh, when we plug in L over 2, we end up with N pi over 2, then minus cosine of 0, which is 1. Then we have plus 2 over L and we'd have minus L squared over two N pi cosine of N pi, and then plus L over N pi squared times sine of N pi minus sine of N pi over two. Right. which we can write as L over N pi times one minus cosine of N pi over two. Minus minus one to the N from this cosine of N pi minus two over N pi times sine of N pi over two. And so thus the Fourier sine series. For this function on zero L is f of x equals sum n goes from one to infinity of these coefficients L over n pi of one plus minus one to the n plus one minus cosine n pi over two. Minus two over n pi sine of n pi over two. Minus one 
times sine of n pi over Lx. Okay, now this function is a little different from the ones we considered before in that while it is continuous, right? Its derivative is not continuous, right? Its derivative uh, is equal to zero between zero and L over two and equal to one between L over two and L. Notice that here, F is continuous and F prime is only piecewise continuous. All right, so it's continuous up to jump singularities. Next time, we'll state a more precise version of the sturm liouville theorem. that allows for this kind of function. Okay, but that will wait till next time.